first video in the new studio, last video of the year, and I thought, what better time to talk about some of the best releases that we have seen and the impressions that they have left on us. Should be fun. And of course, talk about my favorite release of the year, which is one that I don't think you would expect. Let's get into it. It's been quite a year for watches. And across the board, we have seen so many releases, whether it's color changes, new sizes, or completely new interpretations of original designs. But in order to make this list as small as possible, I had to put some rules down. And these rules are, they need to be new in some way or another. They cannot be resized. I'm not going to be talking about pieces simply because they have had a new color change. And preferably the watches I've chosen are not existing models. They have to be new models to the catalog or very good evolutions of the previous interpretation. And on the wrist, no surprise, GPHG winner, which has been pretty cool, uh, Tudor Pelagos FXD. Absolutely adore this watch. It's still my daily driver. It's been with me ever since I've done this move and it's become such a companion. I've had it now for, I don't know, nine months or so. And it is exceptional. It is just fantastic. From the profile to the timekeeping, it is dead accurate. Uh, to the size, the presence, the, the strap wearability. It's just great, you know? First subject we're talking about, the year of green. We have seen so many interpretations of green watches. Evolutions of current product lines, but green has obviously been one of the predominant colors chosen. Three watches that have stood out to me the most, the Seamaster Professional 300, the Seaweed Seamaster, a fantastic color choice. So dark that it almost goes black in certain lights, subtle enough that it's completely understated, and it fits the genre of a dive watch so nicely too. I think in many ways it's reinvigorated a lot of people and excited them about the Seamaster collection. And I mean, who can blame them? It looks beautiful. The next to receive the green treatment is the JLC Polaris. This one really stood out to me, an exciting colorway. This olive sunburst finish brings across a completely new image to the product line. And again, brought people back to look at the Polaris now with a fresh set of eyes. And the Glasuta CQ, 39.5 millimeter, the reinterpretation of the original model now in a darker seaweed green. Very much like the Seamaster Professional, this gives off a subtle tone of color but also gives it life. And the subtlety of the green combined with the stark white elements allows it to stand out so nicely and work as a dive watch better than most. Put it this way, it stands out far more than a black dial, but it's not necessarily a color that will garner a second look, and that's great. Now to my biggest disappointment of the year. The Tudor Ranger. This is a subjective opinion, obviously. I've asked for this watch year after year. I had so many ideas of how they could interpret it, and they did in many ways make a literal translation of the original Ranger from the 1970s. But sadly, it just didn't come across as an exciting proposition. The size and the scale of the watch could have been tightened a bit better. The color of the loom used, this yellowy green color, doesn't work very nicely as a package. And the way they positioned this watch of being the cheapest Tudor that you could buy, it is still the case. I just wish it had a bit more love put into it. It feels too mass produced with not enough care and love in the details. Don't get me wrong though, this has huge potential. The fact that this is the starting point means that they can evolve it. So many people have been asking for this watch in 36 millimeters and I'm sure we'll be seeing it soon enough. We could see this watch in a full titanium finish, completely changing the image of this piece. If I was to offer any suggestions, just give us white loom plots. You don't need a green creamy color to make this watch more exciting. Less is more with this watch and color wise, pairing this watch with straps, we want something that's neutral in color. But as far as the best releases of this year, let's start at the very top. The very first watch I actually reviewed this year was the Omega Speedmaster 321 in Canopus Gold. Following the CK2915 broad arrow aesthetic, but simplifying it, streamlining it, the beauty of this watch is in its subtlety. Not everyone's going to like this watch, of course. The broad arrow design only appeals to a certain audience. But for me, it's seeing this watch in white gold with an onyx dial with a 321 caliber. It ticks all the boxes of being a watch that's not overly pretentious, extremely subtle in design, but has all the specialities to its design that not everyone would notice at first glance. The Zenith Defy Revival A3642. This being one of the original Defy watches and is something special. It's so odd, so peculiar, but does say Zenith Defy all the way. I love the colors that were chosen. I love that the size is period correct, but more so that this watch exists and that the sky is the limit to see evolutions of many other watches in Zenith's back catalog in the future. The Speedmaster 57 was a watch I really enjoyed talking about this year and it's an exciting upgrade of a previous model. 
With the coaxial movement technology, a great size and presence, the adjusted bracelet and clasp. This watch says Speedmaster elegance all the way. It looks refreshing, it looks stylized, it has a sense of fashion and something more dress oriented than being more of a sports watch. But it looks brilliant with these new dial colors and no doubt it's going to be popular for years to come. The Planet Ocean Ultra Deep was a nice surprise and to me at least I still find it to be the uncontested design winner when we look at aesthetics compared to the Sea Dweller, which we will get to later. The Planet Ocean is an excellent collection, but I think with these pieces what made them all the better, especially for going to depths of 6,000 meters, is that these watches are actually wearable. They're not so oversized, so overbuilt, unnecessarily so. Look, granted we are talking about traveling six kilometers down in the ocean, which none of us would ever do, but all of that said, it's still a watch that you could put on your wrist and wear every day and not feel hindered by its size and its presence. The Longines Spirit Zulu Time was another watch that came out of nowhere. More important than anything else, it's a true GMT watch at an affordable price. It has all of the traits you would want out of a modern watch from ceramic bezel, sapphire crystal, great water resistance, and a combination of numerals, all of those elements that work exceptionally well in the Spirit Collection. It's obviously a part of this family. You can see it very easily. Now, as much as I was a huge fan of the JLC Polaris in green, the Polaris Perpetual Calendar was on another level. What I love so much about this piece is it communicates it's a JLC sports watch, but also shows JLC's watchmaking at the same time. It's the best of both worlds. A stupidly high perpetual calendar complication in an everyday sports watch. This is an enthusiast's dream. Now the Rolex Air King, a watch that we all expected to be discontinued, was updated yet again. Crown guards, fully loomed Arabic numerals, an increase in bracelet size, and now it looks head scratching and more perplexing than ever before. But I like it because it's a good talking point and it's a great looking watch. And similarly, we look to the GMT left-hand drive, another head scratching model but one that's also a great talking point. And I think what I enjoy most about these two pieces is that Rolex being the status quo on sports watches, they are questioning themselves. They are questioning their own status quo and where their designs could go. You know, they're reconfiguring older designs. They're doing things that they've never done before. So instead of seeing the typical rinse and repeat, the change of colors, now we are seeing something entirely new and there is no knowing where they will go next. The Richard Lunger Minute Repeater, an absolutely exceptional piece, epitomizing Lunger design, the simplicity, the subtlety of the way they approach their work. The Richard Lunger collection being identified by the Roman numerals on the dial. What makes this watch so incredible is its size at 37 and a half millimeters. The fact that it's something like seven millimeters thick, but has a Minute Repeater housed inside. One of the most highly technical complications you can get out of a watch. But the beauty is no one would ever know. Only the enthusiast, only those who really know their watches. The Grand Seiko Kodo Constant Force. What a machine. Beautiful in design, completely skeletonized everywhere. We could say overdone, but Grand Seiko put so much effort into creating this tourbillon movement. The finishing, the mechanics, the open work componentry. There is a relationship you could say that there are many elements of classic design to this watch, but tons of modernity at the same time. This is Grand Seiko exhibiting that they're not just beautiful dial manufacturers. They can do things exceptionally well on a watchmaking front. And this is a work of art. The recreated Vacheron Constantin 222. Not much needs to be said about this watch. Integrated bracelet, absolutely gorgeous. Great to see this piece again and what it represents, especially a watch that you know epitomizes the 1970s for Vacheron as a brand. My favorite element to this watch is the bezel. It looks almost like a bottle cap. And in gold with that custard dial, it just works so nicely. The Doxa Army, created in collaboration with watches of Switzerland. This being a piece that's loosely interpreted and belongs to the Synchron name, I believe. There's lots of cool military history behind these watches, but it looks odd. It looks 1970s. Some even came with a bronze bezel. It's a great watch if you love your military history, and it's an even better talking point. The MBNF Legacy Sequential Evo. I don't need to say anything more. This watch is... It's a standout. MBNF's first chronograph, deciding to put two movements in one, the ability to sequentially link the chronographs as they're running, also independently time them. If you want to tell the time, the hands are at the six o'clock position, but the real focus is on the chronograph, the balance between these two movements put together, and just how masterfully executed it was. One of the top showstoppers of this year. The Breitling Cosmonaut. Now the Navi Timer was a great surprise this year as well, but the Cosmonaut crept in out of nowhere. A watch that's defined by the 24 hour dial with the AOPA logo. It's so nicely balanced and finished. It's a great looking piece. As far as a reissue, a reinterpretation, this is also one of the best. And let's be honest, whether it's the 806, the 765, or this new Cosmonaut, they are the trifecta. These are some of the best reissue watches that you can get. They are phenomenal.
The Zenith Observatoire with a caliber 135, created in collaboration with Kari Vutalainen. This is a limited edition collection of pieces that has an amazing history because these are observatory rated chronometer movements. Original and classic Zenith movements that were tested and regulated and put away, now to be recovered and used in this small batch of pieces. You know, think of this as a small batch whiskey, one that's been stored away for 50 years. That's the significance of this watch. Paired then with Kari Vutalainen, one of the best watchmakers of our time, it's just the cherry on top of the cake. The Breitling Super Ocean Slow Timer, their reinterpretation of a classic design, bringing more of a snowflake element and aesthetic to their collection. Now in my critique of this watch, I mentioned that I would have loved to have seen this watch as a chronograph and not just a time only. I think it should have stayed more true to the original diving chronograph of the time. But through this watch, they've also been able to instill the quintessence of what made this piece unique. And I think they've done a good job with it. Time will tell whether or not it's going to stay relevant, if it's going to be updated or evolved. But it's definitely a piece in their sports watch collection that's worth talking about, worth looking at. And I think one that speaks greatly about being a dive watch. The Tissot PRX Chronograph, a further evolution of the PRX collection. A great watch, great size, great collection. You're getting a piece that's falling into that integrated bracelet category at entry level prices. And the real beauty is you can enjoy this watch whether you're new to the hobby or if you've been in it for a very long time. It's one of those watches that pleases a lot of people. Now the Tissot Telemeter 1938 was a big surprise and I think they addressed it so nicely. A reinterpretation of their classic telemeter designs brought up in scale and size, houses an excellent automatic caliber at an affordable price, and the real beauty is that that gilt dial has had so much love and care put into it. I was very close to picking up one of these watches earlier in the year just because of how incredible it looked as a configuration. And it really goes to show that you don't need to break the bank to have an exceptional design. The Tudor Pelagos 39mm is is quite a talking point. It seems to be the only subject that most people are discussing at the moment. And it's to do with the fact that it's a watch that addresses all the critiques that were originally put on the piece. The size has now been brought down. It's lost some of the original Gen 1 inspirations in favor of being a more streamlined piece. But all that said, it fits the criteria, categories, of what makes for just one of the best titanium tool watches that money can buy. My first early critique of this watch was that I believed that Tudor has Black Bay fired the Pelagos 39mm. And that can be said when you look to the 6 o'clock on the dial at the text and how the typeface is done, very Black Bay influenced. But all that said, it's a great piece. Would I trade the Pelagos FXD for the 39? Nope. The Apple Watch Ultra. Yes, it made the list. Why? I think it speaks to the watch enthusiast in some way. And for me, it was the first time that I've ever actually considered owning an Apple Watch. And that's quite a big thing. I never thought that would be the case. It obviously has a few flaws and issues relating to it, battery life being one of the main problems, but that's always going to be the case. All things considered though, as far as Apple goes and their smartwatch collection, this one's quite exciting and I really liked it. The IWC Mark 20, the evolution of the Mark 18. They skipped 19 because XX looks better on a dial and they've improved it in almost every way. From shifting the plots around to incorporating the new movement, keeping that excellent size, it epitomizes what makes for an excellent pilot watch and brandishes IWC's name fully. The Speedmaster Chrono Chime was another watch that came out of left field that surprised a lot of us. For me at least, it's the complication involved, it's the fact that Omega introduced an entirely new caliber, one that had never been invented before. The ability of being able to chime the chronograph and its elapsed time is something truly special that no other watchmaker has done. And a movement like this shows you that clear distinction between a watch manufacturer and a watchmaker. Omega is a watchmaker. Finally, the Rolex Deep Sea Challenge, quite an exciting launch of their first full titanium dive watch that can now travel to full ocean depth, 11,000 meters to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. For a commercial dive watch, this is exciting, no matter the brand name associated with it. The huge bonus about this watch, I think, is that it's not going to be one for everyone. It's another piece that divides opinion, and only a small percentage of watch buyers will be able to wear it and enjoy it to its full capacity. Because realistically, it can only fit a small percentage of wrists. But then we compare it to the Ultra Deep, and I still think the Ultra Deep nailed the execution better, purely because it's a watch that many more people can wear and enjoy. Still get that ridiculous depth capability, but also have a watch that has beautiful balanced Arabics on its dial with a great use of colors and finishes. Now look, there were so many other good watches, like the Moser Streamliner in Vantablack, but that goes against the formula because it's just a new color configuration. 
but to the best watch of the year. My favorite watch of the year. I think undoubtedly one of the best releases of 2022, if not the best. Has to be the Christopher Ward C1 Bel Canto. This piece does it all, and let me explain why. A true enthusiast's watch. Affordable price point that virtually anyone can afford. A wearable size. Beautiful sunburst dial configurations. A movement that's made and finished by names that contribute to brands like Armin Strom and Angelus. A configuration that has Moser-esque elements, a sense of minimalism, a great sense of modernity, but take the most important elements and instead of hiding them away, putting them on the front of the dial, celebrating the mechanics and the watchmaking. Not only that, we could consider it high horology for an affordable price. A sonnery that chimes every hour, a grade five titanium case. And let's not forget the colors of dials that are continuing to be made. And I think to everyone's joy and excitement, the Christopher Ward logo and branding is not on the front of the dial, which means that your attention can focus on the mechanics and not the text. This design is going to be relevant for years to come. The colors are effervescent, the price, was relatively affordable. Don't know what they're like today. But it's that complete package of a watch like this that speaks to me. The design, the execution, the love and care that went into the detail, and the fact that many could get to enjoy this watch and what it stands for. Parting question to leave you with, what was your favorite watch release of this year? This was a small series of pieces that I chose. There were many more. Just the configurations of colors and dials alone made some exceptionally great watches that I have left off this list. But until then, I raise a glass to you. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the new year.